We have brothers and sisters that we're uh, in unity with all over this world, and there certainly is distance between us. But that's because of who you are and because of uh, the fact that you reside in our hearts and we in yours, and we're forever grateful for that. And now, Father, as we turn our attention to your word, as we always do, we need to hear from you. There's nobody out here that needs to hear anything from me or from any other human being. As a matter of fact, we need to hear from you. So as we move forward in our study in the Gospel of Matthew um, and uh, look at some things that, once again, uh, challenge maybe the, the perspective that we've always been comfortable with, um, nevertheless, these things are the reality of the situation. And so we pray that, uh, that you would help us to see it from your perspective and the significance of what these things mean. So take this time, Lord, be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to continue on in Matthew's gospel in the 11th chapter. I'm not sure that we'll finish it today. But we're in a very interesting portion of Scripture. We now know that Jesus has sent out the 12 uh, to minister uh, amongst the local cities. And while they were out, he is out ministering himself, doing things, uh, saying things that only uh, the Messiah can do. There, there was no confusion there. And we talked about why that is significant because of John sending, John the Baptist, that is, sending um, two of his guys to find out. Um, because the reality wasn't John's confusion, but the fact that these two guys were hanging out with him when Messiah was clearly evident. And so as we've been looking at all of these things, we're going to continue this morning and see the teaching of Jesus as he talked about John and the character of John. And what we're going to see is Jesus is going to bring um, the messenger, uh, not a contrast, but I guess to, to sort of enhance the messenger, the role of John the Baptist versus that of the Messiah. And he's going to show that, uh, he's going to tell us that in his day, in particular in the generation in which uh, we're privy to hear both the messenger and Messiah in person, that we're going to see that they were just indifferent. They really didn't want to decide one way or another. And that's really what this passage is about. Now, as we move forward here, we're going to see that Jesus is going to challenge some of the cities in which he was ministering. And we're going to identify those cities and look at them, but more importantly, we need to see why they're significant. And so to do that, we need to get a basis because we know from previous chapters and from other gospels as well, that when Jesus was here and stayed in the north, in other words, up around the Sea of Galilee, that it was the city of Capernaum where Jesus stayed. And we believe that, uh, as far as we can tell, that uh, Peter had a house um, that, uh, where he lived with his wife and his mother-in-law. And we saw Jesus with that whole situation just here not long ago. Um, but now Peter is living in Capernaum. However, Peter wasn't from Capernaum. He was from a place called Bethsaida, which we're going to talk about, but they're literally like two miles apart. And so we're going to get into all of that that's important. But this city, Capernaum, it's really important for us to understand why Jesus chose this place and where Peter is to actually make his quote-unquote residence while he ministered in this particular area. Now, we know from previously in our studies, and for those of you that may not have been with us, that the city of Capernaum to Jesus, to the apostles, to the people of that day was literally called Kafer Nahum. And what that means is the village of Nahum the prophet. This is where Nahum the prophet lived. This is where he ministered. And so if we want to understand all of this that's, that's surrounding this, these particular events and why Jesus, you know, he doesn't just by chance do anything. Why does he take up residence at Peter's house in Kafir Nahum um, instead of some other place? I mean, why does he do that when he's in this? Well, there's a very specific reason for that. And we have touched on it in the past, but today we will... We will bring it out even more and get an understanding. 
One of the problems, as I have stated in the past, is that we have this tendency to always want to view the scriptures through our Western rose-colored glasses and look and try to get an understanding of all things theological from that perspective. The problem with that, it's not that there's anything necessarily wrong with it, but the problem with it is there's a tendency to overlook or look beyond maybe um, the, 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 the correctness of what's actually happening. When Jesus was on this earth in this village ministering to these people 2,000 years ago, make no mistake about it. You can look at all of the historical writings from the time. They knew the things that we're about to talk about. We oftentimes either just set them aside, uh, uh, like the people that we're going to be talking about. We ignore them. We're indifferent to them. Or frankly, we just are ignorant of them, and we don't really know and understand these. So we need to get a perspective on this, because when Jesus is going to uh, uh, bring up these cities that we're about to talk about, there's a reason that these cities are the ones that catch the heat from him. And there's a reason for that because of the region that they are in. And so we need to get an understanding. So what I want to do this morning, before we get into Matthew chapter 11, starting in the 16th verse, I want to go back and just look at a few verses, actually from the prophet Nahum. Now, before we go there, understand that Nahum was a, was a minister, uh, and it was his prophecies, his proclamation was to the southern kingdoms of Israel. He, he ministered roughly 650 years to 620 years before Jesus. And so the northern tribes had already been taken by the Assyrian Empire. So that's how we know that his ministry was to the south. Now, the reason that the northern tribes have been taken captive by the Assyrian Empire was because they had rejected the God of Israel and embraced the gods of the nations. And because of that, God's punishment on them was to disperse them amongst the nations. Now, that's precisely what Moses said God would do in the book of Deuteronomy over and over and over again, starting in chapter 2, starting in chapter 3. Three, chapter 4, certainly when you get to the end of the book, Moses very clearly says that I know when I'm no longer here that this is what you are going to do. And we know from our study in the book of Deuteronomy that the punishment for rejecting God and embracing the gods of the nations would be that God would disperse them amongst the nations. Moses wrote that. I didn't. And so it's very important that we understand that. So the way of the north has gone as Moses said that it would. The problem is the southern kingdom of Judah had learned nothing and were in fact repeating the same problems and embracing the gods of the nations that surrounded them. So when the prophet Nahum, actually Nahum, when he comes on the scene, whose name, by the way, means comforted, um, as he comes on the scene, his message is to the southern tribes, Benjamin and Judah in particular, with remnants of the other ten, and his message to them is that they are about to go the same way that the northern tribes had gone. And so Nahum's message, his prophecy, as we call it, his proclamation from God, was about God's impending judgment on the south if they continued down the path that they're on. That God's uh, judgment would be upon the south just like it had been on the north because they too were embracing. So it's speaking about the manifestation of God judging his people Israel for doing the same things that the people had done before him. Now remember where Jesus is in the village of Nahum. What is the message he's about to say? The same message that he gave to Nahum 650 years before he walked this earth. That judgment is coming, and we're going to see that as we move through. But let's take a look at the first few verses of the book of Nahum to understand. Now, this is one of those difficult tasks that you have when you teach, because you want to bring out sort of the heart 
of whatever it is that you're trying to communicate. And really, I, I almost put the entirety of the first chapter. The problem is I have this tendency to sort of go over things repeatedly, and if we'd have done that, we wouldn't even have got out of Nahum chapter 1 today. So what I did is I sort of condensed it down to just, as you can see here, the first four verses, because these four verses are going to directly correlate to what we're about to see in the 11th chapter of Matthew's gospel. So let's take a look at Nahum's message to the southern tribes. The burden against Nineveh. So he's speaking to the kingdom of Assyria is what's happening here. Now remember that Nineveh, about 150 years earlier, had had a prophet of their own sent to them whose name was Jonah. And 150 years earlier, Jonah had come telling them that God was going to judge them. But in Jonah's day, they had repented. They had recognized that the God of Israel is the God, is the God of all nations. But they had forgotten that message about 150, somewhere in those years later, between the ministry of Jonah and the ministry of Nahum. And so now God is going to bring judgment on the Assyrian Empire but also, as you move through the book, on his people for embracing these particular gods. Okay? So he's going to compare this as to what's going on. So this is right towards the end of the Assyrian Empire and the beginning of the Babylonian Empire. That's where Nahum is writing in that particular time. So the burden against Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. I didn't know that Nahum was from Nevada. Apparently he's from Elko, but either way. Um, but that's what he is. He's called the Elkoshite. Now watch what's happening here, because this is very significant to where we're going in Matthew chapter 11. God is jealous, and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance. Boy, you think maybe there's a message of, I don't know, vengeance on this? Um, will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. Now, let me stop right here and understand this. Again, from our Western perspective, the things that are really, uh, that are bad, what we call sins— they tend to be things, you know, we, we, could, we could make a whole list of them, adultery, drunkenness, and all that stuff. And they are, that is true. But when God speaks or when God's prophets speak of wickedness, it moves far from that realm of what man does. And it's, and it's a charge against those nations, including the people of Israel, who embrace other gods. In other words, they're replacing the true God. That is what will bring God's wrath every time. Every time. So when you see that, he will not acquit the wicked. It's not the adulterer or the drunken. Surely those things are included in it. But that is not the point. The point is that who these people are, what they're doing is they have embraced these gods, and God said, I will not tolerate that. That is what wickedness means here. We've got to get the, the sin concept as we understand it out of the picture and understand what the Bible is really saying. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. So that clearly tells us that whatever's being described here, this wickedness, God is not going to stir up the storms because of adultery, as bad as it is, and as contrary to who he is as it is. That he's not going to do that for those. So clearly something is being described here that God himself will move against it. Okay? That's what's being described. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry and dries up all the rivers. Now here we go. 
This is where the wickedness comes in and the idea of other gods that, that, uh, that mankind, regardless of what nation, including America, including Israel, including every other nation that has ever lived, when we move the God of creation out of the way and embrace anything in his place, that's what's being described. Now look at the areas being described because we're going to tie this directly into the 11th chapter of Matthew. Notice, he rebukes the sea and makes it dry, dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither, and the flower of Lebanon wilts. Now pay attention to these three names. Bashan, if you have been with us for any length of time, or have come and been a part of our Wednesday study, you understand, and this is the reason that I say it over and over and over again, Bashan is a place where bad things happen. And everybody knew it before Jesus, in Nahum's day, in Jonah's day, all the way back to even in Abraham's day, in Moses' day. Over and over again, you can see that bad things happen in Bashan. Okay, it's an area that was recognized as ultimately a place where the dead walk. So zombie nation, uh, you know, all of this walking dead stuff that we have today, we think this is new and created. It is not. It is just the rearing, uh, once again, of something that the world has known all along. But we don't want to talk about it because our rose-colored glasses don't like to deal with this particular issue. We have no problem with the supernatural and the natural when it comes to the incarnation of Christ. But we won't tolerate it from anywhere else. Well, if the enemy is going to warp and pervert everything that God does, why would he not warp and pervert the supernatural and the natural uh, in, in these other areas? But we don't want to hear that. Even though all of them, Josephus, Eusebius, Tertullian, Irenaeus, all of these guys said that's what happened. But we ignore them because we're smarter in the West, and it's our rose-colored glasses that allow us to see more clearly, apparently. But that's not what the world that Jesus lived in understood, certainly not what the world that Nahum. So notice what he's saying here, Bashan and Carmel. All right, that's the second place. We're going to see these directly relate to where we are. Mount Carmel sticks out. It's right over there today. It's by the modern city in Israel called Haifa. It's right in that area. What happened on Carmel? What happened on Carmel was Elijah the prophet um, was confronted by some 800 prophets of their God, the Phoenician God, which would later be Lebanon, was confronted by their gods, and the God of Israel was challenged. And we know the story of Elijah against the prophets of Baal. We know the story. You see, there's a spiritual conflict going on in this area. Well, we, again, we don't like to talk about that, but they had no problems clearly understanding it. Okay, so there's Bashan, bad things come from there. By the way, Bashan, when you read through, uh, through the, 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 uh, the Torah, the instructions of God, this is where Og, this is where King Sahon, this is where all of these other people lived who are all, who are all identified from the scripture as being descendants of Anak. In other words, they were called the Anakim. Right? And they were the Rephaim. The Rephaim are the dead ones. Okay? So that's the area that we're talking about here. And so Carmel is really sort of west of that, but it all runs through, and you'll see here when we show this in just a minute. But that's not all. And the flower of Lebanon wilts. So whatever is Bashan, Carmel, and Lebanon from Nahum's, whatever it is, this is a fertile area. There's good things that can come from there. But God is going to bring judgment. Now, if we continued in the book of Nahum in the first chapter, we would see all of this, and there's going to be one. He's going, we're going to find that he's talking to a specific individual who was arrogant enough to think that he is 
he is in a position equal with the God of heaven. And of course, this was the ruler of the Assyrian Empire at this time, but it goes beyond that and looks down to the last days when somebody just like that will raise his head again. We call him the Antichrist. I call him big mouth, arrogant one, because that's what he is. And he's about to come on the scene. So that's what's being described here. So you have to keep this in mind. In fact, that ruler is called later on the Assyrian. So if you look at a map and you see as a whole, this was what was known as the Assyrian Empire. What was the heart of the Assyrian Empire? Bashan. Okay, so you've got all of these direct connections. This is not lost on Jesus or the people to whom he's ministering to some 600 years later in the, in the region, the northern region of Israel called Galilee. So prior to this, he had talked about John the Baptist. He had talked about who I am, what I'm doing. You know, these are the things that only Messiah can do. That's what you need to tell John. In other words, so you guys say, okay, we, John, we need to go with this guy since he's the Messiah. And that's what that was all about. And Jesus explained, and we closed last week, talking about, for him who has ears to hear, let him hear. Okay? So in other words, if you get this, this is going to help you understand. Now, immediately after that, in verse 16, but what shall I liken to what shall I liken this generation? So immediately after saying, if you have ears to hear, in other words, if you pay attention and you'll take a hold of this, remember we looked at that, you're going to understand it. But in contrast to that, Jesus said, I want to explain to you what this generation is like. Now, it's very key to understand what he's saying here. This generation, the generation that existed at the time he was ministering and accomplishing works that only Messiah could do. Right? So it's very important that we keep this in mind. Because again, with our Western rose color, we look at all of these scriptures and we think generations and we think, oh my gosh, and then we're all trying to figure out when the Lord's coming back because it said when this generation, when we get to Matthew chapter 24, because that's a complete misunderstanding. They would never, the people hearing Jesus and Jesus himself would never have had that perspective. He was talking about those that were present to hear, to see, to understand what it was that he, Messiah, was doing. That's the generation. So what shall I liken this generation to what? Here's what he likens it to. Strange, very strange saying, to us, but not to them. Here's what this generation is like, Jesus is saying, where I'm ministering. Now, remember, he's going to all of these cities. He's showing that he is the Messiah. The apostles are going to other cities testifying that he's Messiah. So you got to keep that in mind. But what is this generation like? Well, here's what it's like. It is like children sitting in the marketplaces uh, and calling to their companions. So they're calling to all of those who they assume are their companions and who assume that see things with the same perspective that they have. What are they saying? Well, now this is very confusing to us, but it's not for them. And hopefully it won't be for us when we conclude this here. And sing, we played the flute for you and you didn't dance. Well, instead then, well, we mourned for you, but you didn't lament. Jesus is saying, here's what this generation is like. It could care less. It doesn't matter where the message is one of joy or whether the message is one of mourning. Either way. These, this generation doesn't care. They're completely indifferent to the message and to the ministry of the Messiah himself, although every one of them would have claimed to have been waiting for him. But they were completely indifferent. It didn't matter whether the message came like the children saying, well, we played the flute and you didn't want to dance. You looked all bummed out, droopy-lipped, 
Well, instead of playing the flute, we put the flutes away and then we started, you know, playing taps. I don't know, whatever. Not taps, what's the one? Anyway, you get the idea. We'd switched. You guys didn't want the joy, so we thought, okay, well, we'll bring a, a message of mourning. But then you didn't even lament. In other words, you didn't care. Now, you have to keep that in mind with what's about to be said. Because Jesus is going to say, this is what this generation's like. It doesn't care. Does that sound familiar? We live in a day and age within our Western rose-colored perspective where we have access to all of these things. There's nothing that hinders any one of us from beginning to understand not just who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, but what he asks of us. It's available to all. We're talking seven, some billion. Now, obviously, not all of them have access, so let's just stick with America. And we have complete access to who he is. Now, let me ask you a question. Overall, where does America stand when it comes to who Jesus is? Well, they don't receive it as joy. They don't really even like it as mourning. What is America today? What's the generation today that has access <clears throat> to everything uh, that Jesus has done and has said continues to do and continues to say indifference we don't care no no we don't have room for him can't have him in our classrooms can't have him in our courtrooms can't have him in our workplaces can't have him you, know, you get the idea we just don't care in fact let's just create something that just moves him aside because we're really tired of hearing about it so let's just take God out of the picture and just say that all of this just happened by chance. Now here's one of the little questions that I have concerning this COVID-19 situation for everybody out there. Because let's face it, folks, most people in the world today would embrace evolution, clearly, especially those in the scientific realm, medical film, medical field and everything. So they'll embrace something Evolution, in other words, whose, uh, whose secondary title is what? The survival of the fittest. Well, if you're going to adhere to that belief, then who are you to complain when the fittest survive COVID-19? Bit hypocritical, isn't it? Well, let's just, you know, we don't want to be calloused and we don't want to be in... No, no, no. You say that you believe in something that says survival of the fittest. So the people that are not surviving, obviously, aren't the fit ones. That's what you say you believe. So which is it? You can't have it both ways. So we don't want to hear this thing about God, America says. We're going to create this other stuff that we say we believe in. We don't really believe in that either. We are indifferent. The world and America could care less for now. That's about to change. But that's what's being described here. That's how it was in Jesus' day. And make no mistake about it, it's how it is today. So now here's the playing the joy and doing the mourning. We can't figure out which it is that you guys want to hear. He's going to start with what he just concluded with, the warning, the morning. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and you say that he has a demon. So the messenger came with a message that's saying the axe is already at the root. And don't say that I'm a descendant of Abraham, so I'm okay. God already knows. Folks, that's not a happy message, all right? That's the message John brought brought. But they didn't want to hear that. In fact, look at what they do. They accredited what he was saying to the work from coming from the spiritual realm. So the truth that John was bringing was being interpreted as having its origin in a realm that is opposed to God. That's how they received the message of John. Now, obviously, not all. There were lots that clearly received John's message. But do you see? This is what the generations is like. John came and brought a message that should have brought mourning. You know, the axe is at the tree. 
But you didn't mourn. In fact, you blamed it on something else. Well, where's the contrast? And the Son of Man came eating and drinking. In other words, fellowship. You see, the difference you have in, in playing the flute and dancing versus mourning and sadness is that likened to a marriage and a funeral. That's what's being described here. John brought a funeral that the things in this life, they have to change. Oh, no, we're not going to believe you because your, your message is coming to us from the dark side. That's what they're saying. But then Jesus came, notice, eating and drinking in a celebrative, joyous, glad setting of a marriage. But they wouldn't want to listen to him either. Son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber. Now, I'm not going to belabor the point here, but this idea, this goofball teaching that's out there, and I do mean goofball, that Jesus didn't drink wine, is absurd based on what Jesus just said. It's difficult for him to be recognized, which is what he said, as a pig, somebody who pigs out, and a drunk if he's drinking grape juice. But we have a real problem with that because, again, through our Western rose-colored glasses, Jesus would never drink alcohol. Stop. The absurdity of statements like that goes beyond comprehension. Okay? You can't, this statement couldn't be made about him if he didn't drink wine. What's the problem? I mean, get over it. That's what they drank. It's what your brothers and sisters drink all over this world. But not in America. We won't tolerate that. It's sad. It's really sad when our theology, like their traditions, overcome the teachings of God's word. It's sad. It's a sad, sad day. Look, a glutton and a wine bibber. But not just that. He's not just the, somebody who pigs out all of the time. And he's not a drunk. Look at what he does. He hangs out with tax collectors and sinners. I mean, clearly, we shouldn't listen to him, even though he's come with a joyous message. Right? That's what Jesus said. This is what the generation. But in contrast to you who were indifferent, notice wisdom is justified by her children. In contrast to that, what is wisdom? Knowledge is knowledge. It's to know things. But if it's never put into practice, it remains just that, knowledge. Wisdom is when you take that knowledge and you begin to act on that knowledge. You put it into practice. Now it becomes wisdom. So the wisdom here is the ability of these people to recognize both the joyous and the mournful message that was brought to them and understand that and then act upon it. That's the children that will bring honor to what Jesus is doing, what John has done, in a complete contrast to that generation. These on the other side. Who are these? Well, mostly it's just the local yokels, as we would call them. The rednecks. The, the common, everyday person. That's who's being described. They had had enough of religion. They had had enough of looking at their world through their rose-colored glasses passed on to them by their religious teachers. And we need to do the same. Let's stop listening to what this person says about God's word or that person says about God, God's word or even what Rick says about God's word and go to God's word and see what it says. Because then it makes a lot more sense. Wisdom is justified by her children. The children of wisdom are those who are in complete contrast to the indifferent generation of Jesus' time, both to his message and to the message of John. Then, having made that statement, having made that clarity, notice what's happening here. Now we're going to go back to Nahum chapter 1. Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. So he's going to take them to task 
as it were, the cities that had the very Messiah himself do Messiah-only works and didn't repent because they were indifferent. Well, here's Jesus' response to that indifference. Now, notice, we don't know what city he's in. We've been told earlier, he's going around the cities. So who are the people that are coming to hear him? Both those that are coming in wisdom to understand and those who are indifferent but still want to come so they can, you know, I don't know, maybe find a problem in what he says. So the people that are hearing him say this, regardless of what city he's in, are from these cities. These are the cities that he had revealed most clearly, most recently, that he was, in fact, the fulfillment of everything that had been written by the law, the prophets, and the writings. But they didn't repent. And he says this. He says, woe to you, Chorazin. Woe. Now we think, woe, like woe, horse here. Woe, dude, mellow out. Woe here meant that it was basically, here's how I would put it. He's about to come upside their head. Enough of the indifference. How do you communicate to somebody who's indifferent? You got to get their attention. When you have children and they just, when you're trying to teach them something or show them something that they've done wrong and they just have that look on their face and they're walking, their eyes are wandering around, what do you do? You say, look at me. You need to understand that what I'm saying is serious. That's what's being described here. Literally in the Hebrew, oelach. Oy, oy vey, we say. Oelach, that's what's being described here. And it means, boom, something's coming. Woe to you, Chorazin. Right? Woe to you, Bethsaida, both cities of Jesus' day. If you look at a map, which we're going to see here in a minute, on the northern side of the Sea of Galilee. Chorazin set back about two miles uh, from the coast. As far as we know, nobody knows what the word means. I tried to chase it down in Hebrew. I couldn't find it. Nobody seems to know. But Bethsaida, you will read in your commentaries or in your footnotes, the house of fishing. That is not what it means. Okay? It doesn't mean that. Do you get my point with the rose-colored glasses? Bait, it actually is the word bait, means house, and Said or Saida in this particular case means provision, food, hunting, you know, whatever. So the idea is that this place was recognized as a house that provided food for its people. The reason they translated it as fishing is because fishing is part of providing for the people. Okay? So they said, oh, it's the house of fishing. It's not the house of fishing. It's a house of nourishment. It's a house of provision. Fishing happens to be the one that was taking place in this village. That's what the name means. Now, how do I know that? Because you go and take a guess at what the Hebrew word for fish is. Dog. A fish is a dog in Hebrew. He is she, who is he, and dog is a fish. We learned this in our Hebrew class. So this isn't Beth dog. This is Bethsaida. So it has nothing to do with fishing, except that fishing represents this house or this place where nourishment was coming from. That's how it got entitled this way. So it does not mean house of fishing. It's a house of nourishment. Now, why is that important? Because who's there? Who's ministering there? Who is from that area? Now, we said earlier, Peter has a house in Capernaum. But guess where Peter and, Peter and Andrew and James and John and Philip, by the way, guess where they're from? Bethsaida, the house of provision. And all five of them would go on to do amazing things for the kingdom of heaven as God nourishes his people with the teaching that these guys would have brought. You see, we connect it to the sea, and it, it certainly is fine to do that, but it's bigger than that. It's broader than that. So woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Why? 
Why are they so, why is he getting on them? Because if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Ceylon, that's Lebanon. We just read it in Nahum, remember? And Carmel, by the way, where Elijah fought the prophets of Baal. That's the area that's being described. And Jesus said, those people, they are not the people of Israel. But if what was taking place in you, in other words, if I was there and they were looking for me in the way that you say you're looking for me, then they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. A, 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 an, an old look at, uh, of absolute mourning. The idea of sackcloth and ashes meant that you were so mournful over your condition that you just made yourself miserable physically, as miserable physically as you were mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And Jesus said, you cities, which I did all of this stuff in, you're indifferent. Woe to you. Because if I had done that in Tyre and Sidon, if I had done that in Lebanon and Carmel, they would have understood. Wisdom is justified by our children. He who has ears to hear, do you see? That's what's being described. They would have repented. Remember back in Jonah's day. Didn't mean the repentance would last. Remember in Jonah, Jonah goes to Nineveh, they repent. He didn't know he doesn't like it. But 150 years later, Nahum's day, they've forgotten all about that. And they've re-embraced their gods. And judgment is coming on them in the form of the Babylonian Empire. So that's what's being described. Now look at verse 22. But I say to you, to who? Chorazin and Bethsaida, to the cities. You people that are here hearing me from those cities. I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Oh, wait a second here. Now, we talked about this a little while ago because, again, our Western perspective is sin is sin and judgment is judgment. There are no levels, but that's not what Jesus just said. Whatever judgment is going to take place, there's, there's, uh, there's an element of difference in it. Because it's going to be worse for you guys because I'm here than it is for them. I never went there. So your judgment is going to be more severe. Oh, I thought it was all the same. Well, it's not the same. It's not. That's the entirety teaching of the whole Bible. It always, there's, a, there's lots of references to this. But the fact is, it's going to be more tolerable for them than for you because I'm here speaking to you and you're still indifferent. You didn't care about John. You don't care about me. You're going to go your way. So it's going to be more tolerable for them because they had the same things happen to them. Had I showed up like Jonah had done to Nineveh, they would have repented. So it's going to be easier on them in the judgment than it is for you. Wow. That's pretty amazing when you begin to stop and really think about it. Now, I don't know about you, but as I'm reading this, I cannot help but see America and UK, and I cannot help but see Canada and South America and all of the other nations of this world in place because there's a reason that the gospel is hated all over this world, but it's, you know, you understand it in a, in a, in a country where the religion is completely contrary to who God is, but when it's in an area where it doesn't have to be, and it's still in the UK, people could care less. In America, we could care less. Wow. Not a good testimony. So let's take a look real quick here. There's Chorazin and, of course, Bethsaida. Let's take a look at a map so we get a bit of an idea what we're looking at here. Okay. So you can see here uh, that... Uh, in Galilee, there you could see that. Here's the two cities, and they're up in the north. There's Chorazin and Bethsaida, okay? That's where Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip are all from Bethsaida. But Peter ends up having the house in Capernaum, which is where Jesus is staying, the village of Nahum. So that so gives you an idea of, of the region that we're looking about. These are the villages that Jesus was going around and speaking that had come to hear him this day. And these are also villages where the, the apostles are going out into all of these areas as well. Okay? Now, if you know where we're going with this, you just look off to the right there just a little bit from that next lake that's up there and you see Mount Hermon. Oh, 
Guess where we're headed. Anyways, and by the way, and you can see Carmel over there, and we're going to point that out later. Now, but it's just not Bethsaida and Chorazim. And you, Khafur Nahum, you see, again, we read this in English, we don't catch the point that they would have caught. And you, from the village of the prophet Nahum, the one that talked about God's impending judgment, where was the indifference there? There was no indifference. Nahum's message could not be denied, especially since it all came to pass. You see? So for him to point out the village of Nahum within this context, again, would have been oilach, would have been a smack upside the head. But watch what happens. And you, chafernum, chafer lehum, who are exalted to heaven. Why is the village of Nahum exalted to heaven? Well, clearly, because Jesus made his residence there. That's one reason. But I think the other reason that we often overlook is because it's where the prophet Nahum was from that brought the message of God. That place has always been a place where messengers from the, king, from the, the throne of God himself all came from this area. Nahum was from there. Jesus is living there. Peter's living there. We already talked about this. And five of the 12 are in this area. So in this particular area is sort of the, the foundation, I guess, of, of those taking the message of repentance, of sin, and of joy, and of God's grace and kindness. It's all coming from this area. And you, Capernaum, you were exalted to heaven. But in contrary to the position that you could have, notice you will be brought down to Hades. Now notice what has happened. We have moved from the, spirit, the physical realm and within the, within the framework of the earth to now all of a sudden heaven and hell enter the picture. Huh. They're all in this area where the dead are. Hades, right? Bashan, we're going to see here in just a second. So notice what he's doing. He's bringing this contrast in. He's saying, even though the message sent from heaven itself originates in here, you're going to be brought down to Hades, the opposite of what was intended, because you're indifferent, because you could care less. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, oh my gosh, it would have remained until this day. Now you're starting to get a little picture of what he's talking about. What happened in Sodom? We, again, I cannot belabor this point. It takes forever. But Jude is the one that tells us in the book of Jude that what was happening in these places where they were going after, and you read, strange flesh that the inhabitants of Sodom wanted strange flesh. And of course, through our Western pink uh, colored glasses, we always want to look at this as, again, homosexuality. What did I say earlier? Wickedness has nothing to do with homosexuality. In fact, these problems that we always blame on this are because of embracing the other gods. That's wickedness. So notice what's happening here. Which were done in you had been done in Sodom. What was happening in Sodom? Jude says they went after strange flesh. Now here's the problem. Again, Western mindset. Strange flesh. Do you know what it literally said? Do you know what the word Jude uses there for strange? Heteros. We get heterosexual from it. So a heterosexual, quote unquote, is normal. And homosexual is ab abnormal, quote unquote. But that's not what Jude said. Jude said that Sodom was going after strange flesh. You know what heteros means? Flesh of a different kind. So when Sodom, they weren't looking, the problem wasn't, again, homosexuality, it was heterosexuality looking for flesh of a different kind. What kind? Genesis 6 kind, maybe? I don't know. How do we know that? Because where Jude, what does Jude go on? That, that they, de, they defile the flesh. They contaminate the flesh. 
What happened to Genesis 6? A contamination of the flesh. Read Josephus, read Eusebius, read Tertullian, read Irenaeus, read all of the guys until, of course, we got so smart in Western Christianity that we say these things couldn't have happened. But they all understood it. So what's happening here is that defilement uh, uh, is, is speaking of contamination. Now let's read Jude's words with what we now know. Well, what happened in Sodom? They were going for flesh of a different kind. Oh. And what, were the, what was going to happen with that flesh? It was going to be contaminated. Why do you think they went after the angels? Do you think they didn't know they were angels? Come on, man. Seriously? Oh, they just saw two new guys in town and thought, hey, we can have our way with them. Really? Come on. It's got to be more than that. It was to such an extent that Lot said, I will give you my daughters instead. <laughs> and he would just do that because these guys wanted some sexual encounter. Please, please, we've got to stop and look at what God's word says. Now, how do we know all of this has this spiritual connection? What's the very What's the very next verse in Jude? Michael. Michael the archangel. Michael the archangel is arguing. It's literally disputed, it says, but he was arguing with Satan, with the adversary over the body of Moses. We're back to flesh. The body of Moses. What's the conflict? Michael and the devil are fighting, the spiritual are fighting over the body of the physical. Really? This is Jude that says this, not Rick. If they had translated it like this, we wouldn't have the problems in the church that we have today. We spend time fighting with one another over whether this is true or not and leaving churches because we don't believe it rather than taking it for what it says. It's sad. But whatever. For if the mighty works which were done in you, Capernaum, where heaven and earth come together, with the Messiah and the message going out with the apostles that are from that area. If this is what's happening, then heaven, you're going to be brought down to Hades. He's moved from heaven and uh, from the earth to heaven and earth. And of course, he brings in Sodom. Imagine that. What a coincidence. It would have remained until this day. They would have recognized what was taking place. But you didn't. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Here we go again. Wow, Sodom was a pretty bad place. But Jesus says it's going to be easier for them when the time comes than it's going to be for you. That's scary. Again, what do you think he would say to America who can sit at home like many of us are doing today? without even have to leave the house and hear the teaching of God's word and yet remain indifferent to it. E, remember the reed shaking in the wind? Yeah, that's, uh, there's just a lot of stuff that's going on. So there's Capernaum. Now let's take a look at the map here because here we're going to tie all of this together. Now we've already seen Chorazin Bethsaida. Obviously you should have already identified uh, Capernaum. Now, if you go slightly to the north, and I made mention of it, because later on, Jesus is going to go up in Matthew's gospel, and he's going to go and minister on that side. We're going to see where that is in just a minute, in Caesarea Philippi, and then we're going to immediately read that he's going to go and be transfigured on a mountain, which is unnamed, but clearly is Mount Hermon. And what is it that happens in Mount Hermon? I will build my church. And my church will storm the gates of Hades, but the gates of Hades cannot stop it. Oh, we already saw this earlier when you see down there, <clears throat> when he crossed over, this particular map doesn't have it, but if you go from Tiberias kind of straight across from there, that's where that region of Decapolis is at. What did Jesus do when he got out of the boat there? Who was he met by? One who came from the tombs, maybe two. We're not really positive, but it appears to be two. One was the focus. And who were they representing? Well, we know of a legion of supernatural. You see, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God of Gods had just set foot into their area and they're immediately saying, no, we know why you are here, right? 
So he's already stepped into this area. We're going to see after all the stuff that we're talking about, he's once again going to cross over in Caesarea Philippi and ultimately go to Mount Harban. Okay? Well, what is this area? Oh, it's called Bashan. We're all the descendants of Anak, the Anakim, the Rephaim. Right? The Zamzamim, the Emim, the, all the memes that we get named for us because they don't want to tell us what they mean. Literally, the walking dead, you know, the, you know, what we get, you, we, that's another study for another time, and you can go back and chase that down. Now, notice what's happening. There's Mount Carmel. Notice that it's all in the same region, and Jesus is up here doing this stuff. So, folks, we, we're at a point as the church where, from where I sit, enough is enough, okay? Okay. I'm tired of being told what to believe because there's this particular theological doctrinal position which is in contrast to this theological and doctrinal position. You know what? Enough. This is just enough. Just stop. When will God's word, not our interpretation of God's word, when will God's word be sufficient for us? When? When? Because when that happens, all of the stuff that has muddled the church, mixed up the church, confused the church throughout its throughout the centuries will be cleared up. We've got to stop worrying about what was written before. Read those things. There's nothing wrong with that. But look at God's word for what it is. I don't know. God's word? And take it at that and stop listening to those who interpret it for us. What I'm teaching you this morning, you need to check out. Wisdom is justified by her children. Am I misleading you or am I not? The only way you're going to know is by testing it with God's word. But here's the indifference. Most of us won't do that. For whatever reason, because like these people that we would like to, well, how could they have been this way? We're just the same. No, we're indifferent because we won't do this on our own. We'll listen to what Rick says. Well, you know, Rick says, and I get told all the time, well, you know, you said this, but so I talked to such and such, and they said this, and it's like, who the crud cares who any, what anyone says? What does the Bible say? Right? What does it say? Your opinion, my opinion, and that's all they are, we call it interpretation, but it's opinion, is irrelevant. What does the word say? Let's, for once in our life, stop being indifferent and start being godly and look and understand what God's word has to say to us. Then we will be called the children of wisdom. Because we'll be taking what we know and putting it into practice. Not because we're told to by someone else, but because the very words of God will give us that direction. Amen? All right, well, listen, you have a good day. Call your mother. Don't say, oh, I don't have a good relationship with your mother. Get over it. Call your mother. Don't be a dork. All right? It's Mother's Day. Swallow your pride and do what you're supposed to do. All right? Love on your mom. Besides, like for me, usually you get to go to a good meal and use it as an excuse. The only thing I'm bummed about is no chocolate for the rest of this week. But I suppose I will survive. All right, having said that, have a great day. We'll see you. Yes, we will actually see you next Sunday. If you need to come in a spacesuit, come in a spacesuit. But don't be upset by those who are not in spacesuits. Come and worship with us if you want to. If you're uncomfortable, stay home. You can still watch us on YouTube or no Facebook, whatever, wherever we're at. And by the way, I watched this thing on YouTube. I think there's something wrong with our camera. It makes me look fat. So there's something wrong. I mean, I know they say a camera adds 10 pounds, but really, anyway, uh, so we'll see you guys next week. Really looking forward to actually getting back together. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Your word, Lord, if we will allow it and not put our guard up, will come alongside our head because it will shake the core of what we believe because it will cut to the heart of the issue, not what we've been taught about the issue. 
And I pray that we as your church, we as your people, would do just that. The word is not an easy thing. There's a reason it's rejected because of the truth it brings. Because the truth, most people, even people that want to be a part of the church, don't want to deal with. And we'll just move on just as indifferent as Bethsaida, Chorazin, and Capernaum were. And we need to be very cautious of that. But we thank you for your word, Lord, which is not interested in my opinion or anyone else's. But it is your word. And if we will study it, we will learn things and get a clarity that we never had before. Thanks for being here with us this morning, Lord. Special blessing on all the moms out there and the families as they spend time together today. We love you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.